I am very honored to be in this pulpit. We're going to have trouble, I tell you, right the bat, because I like seeing myself on TV. That's pretty cool. <laughs> kind of like Billy Graham. Amen. <laughs> and uh, I look pretty good, too, if you don't mind me saying <laughs> Two of the biggest lies you'll ever hear. Two of the biggest lies you'll ever hear. The check's in the mail, and the preacher says he'll be brief. That's, you, I, I promise you, that's... It's really good to be here tonight. I love you, Pastor. My name is Ron Talley, and I'm the pastor of the Hiles Baptist Church, named after Dr. Jack Hiles. And I've been there 31 years. I spent seven years in Florida as a youth director after I graduated in 1979. I came to Hiles Anderson College in 1974. It took me five years to jam in four years. I came to school with a wife and two children. While I was here, we had our third child. And it, uh, by far, some of the toughest days of my life, but by far, some of the best days of my life. I love Brother Eddie. Brother Eddie's been a friend of mine now for over 40 years. And I thank God for his ability, his stickability, his kindness to me. Brother Ray Young has just been a gentleman to me all week. And him and I came to college together the same year, 1974, and graduated together in 1979. And uh, Brother Ray Young is one of the great men to ever walk through America I'm honored to be friends with Brother Ray Young and Brother Roy Moffat and I were in class together. And if you think I'm reminiscing, I am. I hope you'll bear with me. This is my home church. My whole life revolved around Dr. Hiles. I am very intimidated to be standing here at this pulpit tonight. I have no right to be here. I'm not sure what will happen, but I'm really glad to be at your church. I had a great time last night with... The Bible Institute, we had a good time, had a great time. Any college students here? What did I preach on today? Somebody holler at me. Are there any men out there at that college today? <laughs> yeah, God can, and he sure can, and we had a great time. And I'd like to tell you, church, I thank you. You have some of the finest young people at the college I've ever been with. And they, they are their enthusiasm, their love for God, some of the finest uh, best ladies and some of the finest and best young men in America at your college right now. Brother Eddie, i got to tell you that, that I, uh, I had a great time at college today. They were just really, really fired up. And it was kind of like old times, and I enjoyed it very much. And I was glad to be there. Looking forward to college tomorrow. Songwriter wrote, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. When we've been there 10,000 years, white shining as the sun, we've no last days to sing God's praise and when we first begun. If you're glad you're saved, say amen. amen. If you're glad you're on your way to heaven, say amen. amen. If you're glad you're going to live long as God's going to live, you can say amen. It's great to be saved, washed in the blood, be born again, and on our way to heaven. It's great to have a warm house and something to eat and, and, and something to drive, and God's been good. Amen. amen. I would like to help you if I can tonight. I don't know if I can do that, but I'm going to try. Brother John Rice, I love you, son. Good to see you, and God bless you. And uh, We used to stay at his home for pastor school and youth conference, and uh, he's been a great friend to me. I'll give you a good story, Brother Eddie. You probably don't know. John, John and I played on the, on the First Baptist Church softball team. Now, they didn't let outsiders play on the church team. Only, the, only church men played. But somehow that got word that I'd, I'd played some ball and, and John Rice and Fred Mooney stopped me in the hallway of Howes Anderson College and said, will you come play with us? And I said, I don't think preacher, by the way, if you, if you knew Dr. Howes real well, you didn't, you didn't even want to, you, 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 he just, you couldn't even get near me to make you shake, you know. And uh, I said, preacher won't like that. And they said, yeah, we've got it okay. Mr. Klingus said it, it's okay. So I played on the first Baptist Church softball team and I was playing shortstop. John was playing left field. And somebody hit a pop fly between John Rice and I, and I went, I went out to get it, and he came in to get it. We hit head on. John knocked me out. <laughs> and uh, I woke up about 30 minutes later. I'm on the bench looking around. The team is playing. I think uh, Glenn Moffat was playing first base, and I think Jack Ross on that second base. And uh, I forget the man that pitched for us that was so good, John, but, but John hit me head on, and he didn't, didn't even bother. He was so hard-headed, it never bothered him, but he knocked me out. And, uh, but the uh, and, and then 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 we got in a fight on the ball, suburban Bible. We got in a fight with them on the, one night, and uh, we were throwing fist. We were throwing more than softballs that night. But the house called the whole team into the church, to his office. I didn't go because I was a college student. And I didn't have to go. <laughs> but anyway, preacher wasn't very happy with them boys. He kicked the team out of the league, and we started playing at college. And 
And oh, God, good, and I'm so glad. And but John Rice, so good to see you, and I love you. And our brother, uh, brother Jerry Vargo, are you here somewhere? All right, brother, thank you for the books. I enjoyed being with you last night. Brother Jerry Vargo and I worked at UPS together a long, long time ago, 44 plus years ago. We worked at UPS together, and then I went back to the steel mill at Blaw Knox. Anybody here ever work at Blaw Knox? Steel mill over in East Gary, Indiana. I worked over there for, I was a welder for four solid years and had a really, really good time over there and it saw me through college. I'd like to have a word of prayer and we'll get started. I have only Father, this is a great church. All my life this church has influenced me and I've always looked to Hammond, Indiana for my leadership and my love. I've looked to Hammond to rock steady that I might be able to make it where I was at out in the world. And I'm very, very honored to be here this evening. I'm going to ask you, Father, you'll touch every man, every woman, every boy and girl here tonight. I'm not scared to preach. I preach 30, 40, 50,000 sermons, but I sure would like to be able to help the folks at the First Baptist Church of Hammond, Indiana. And I pray, God, you'd bless the men on the staff here and the men who keep the church going. Take care of Pastor Wilkerson tonight. What a great man. What a humble, wonderful servant of God he is. And I'm honored to be able to stand, sit in his chair, stand in his pulpit. And I pray, God, you'd lay your hands on him in Texas and, and watch over him. And I pray you'd bless him, his wife, his children, his family, and all the church here. Help us tonight, Father. We love you. In thy name we pray. Amen. I want you to open your Bibles with me tonight for just a few minutes to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14. I dreamed many dreams that never came true. I've seen them vanish at dawn, but I have realized enough of my dreams to keep me dreaming on. I prayed many prayers when no answers came, though I prayed long and hard. But God has answered enough of my prayers to keep me praying on. I sowed many seeds that fell by the way for the birds to feed upon. But I've held enough golden cheese in my hand to keep me sowing on. I've had many friends that have proven untrue. They left me to weep alone. But enough of my friends have proven true blue to keep me trusting on. You ought to be glad tonight that God's given you a friend, God's given you a church, God's given you a pastor, and you ought to thank God for it and live for God the way you ought to live. Amen. Uh, it, which, if I talk too fast, she'll be able to keep up with me, right, Brother Eddie? Uh, okay. She, she, so we'll, she'll, she'll be able to follow me, won't she? I'm going to tell you, I didn't get on to get off. I didn't get hot to get cold. I didn't start out to quit. Amen. Brother Ross well, said it's a battlefield, brother, not a recreation room, it's a fight, not a game. Run if you want to, run if you will, but I came here to stay. Now I'm very glad to be at the church tonight. I'm going to read to you from Matthew chapter 14, and I'll read to you, let's see, um, we'll start around about verse 15 of Matthew chapter 14. And the Bible says, when it was evening, disciples came to him saying, this is a desert place, and the time is now past. Send a multitude away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves victuals. But Jesus said unto them, They need not depart, give you them to eat. And they say unto him, We are here with five loaves and two fishes. And he said, Bring them hither to me. And they commanded the multitude to sit down in the grass and took the five loaves and two fishes. And looking up to heaven, he blessed and brake and gave the loaves to his disciples. And the disciples took the to the multitudes. And they did all eat. And they were good Baptists. Amen. Something else, I'm a Baptist born and Baptist bred. And when I die, I'll be Baptist dead. Amen. I like being Baptist preacher. Hallelujah. I'm not going to drop the name Baptist. I like the Hiles Baptist Church. Amen. I got the best church in the whole world, best people in the whole world. I'm, uh, Brother Eddie, I'm driving a Ford F-150 four-wheel drive, 2014, on my 63rd birthday. I'm preaching that morning. One of the men comes to the pulpit. I get done. He said, they want you outside. I'll tell somebody it happened. I wonder bust you. They got something that happened, you know. I walk out to front of my church, there's almost a brand new Ford pickup truck, and they handed me the title, so happy birthday, preacher. God's good, amen. And I, I, the, 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 I, I, I pastored the greatest church in all the world in the Hiles Baptist Church. Dr. Hiles wrote me a letter, and he said to me, he said, Ron, when you change the location, we changed about five times trying to find a place to build. We started in a red barn, went to a school, went to a veteran's building, and a double wide and a big green tent, and it's a long story, but it's a good story. Dr. Hiles wrote me a note and said, Preacher, with Brother Tally, when you leave, change, don't change that name. He said, the name Hiles is going to hurt you, not help you. So I called all my men together, was meeting in the garage, didn't have an office, didn't have no church building, got in the garage, and I said, Dr. Hiles says, when we move to Courthouse Road, we ought to change our name. 
I mean, all the guys rebelled, said, well, that's the greatest preacher in the whole world. Why would we change our name? I, thought, I just thought he didn't want to do that. But, so now for 31 years, we've had the High House Baptist Church. They started the church. Another man did. He owned a TV shop, started the church in his living room, playing Brother Hiles on cassette tape. And then they, they called me in Florida, and I came to Virginia, and I took over, and I've been there 31 years. And when I left my home, my, my office, uh, I now have a church office and a built-in baptistry, and God's blessed our church. And when I left my church to come here, Dr. Hiles is teaching Proverbs chapter 12 on my cassette tape player in the old, in old Jack Hiles auditorium. And uh, I love our preacher. Somebody say amen. amen. How many of y'all know Brother Hiles? Okay. Greatest preacher in the whole world. Good end in history, Dr. Hiles. Built the greatest church in the whole world, the greatest pastor to ever live. And I love preacher. Miss him greatly. He, uh, he always took care of me. I'm going to continue reading at verse 22. And straightway Jesus constrains his disciples to get into a ship to go before him to the other side. While well, he sent the multitude away. When he said, sent the multitude away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. You ought to mark that down. You ought to spend some time alone with God. People don't like alone time. Everywhere I go, I, they went, I want someone to Christ now, Brother Eddie, every day for almost eight years. And, and they see me coming now. They love to do two things. They put the telephone up so they can ignore me and answer the door. Or put, put earplugs or earbuds or something in. And folks don't like to be alone. Dr. Howells taught us this. You walk with men while men are awake. And you walk with God while men sleep. And you ought to find some time to spend alone with your God and love your God. And he was there alone. And the Bible says at, there at, let me see, uh, verse 24. The ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves. Uh, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. But Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. When Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And began to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. They have, we have a story here of the disciples were in a ship. And the Bible says the winds come up and the waves come up. And they're out there. And it's in the dark of the evening, dark of the morning. Third, and the Bible says that Jesus comes walking to them on the sea. The disciples, like you and I, if you got any good sense, see somebody walking on water, they get scared. And the Bible says that Jesus said, be not afraid, it is I. And then Peter said, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come to you. And Peter got out of the boat when walking to where Jesus was. I would like to speak to you tonight on, on how to be a water-walking Christian. How to be a water-walking Christian. Do you know we live in a world, we live in a, a changing world. In 1900, man traveled by horse and buggy. 1969, a man was walking on the moon. We're living in a very fast, very moving world of time and energy and experience and learning and growing. But you ought to find just, look, what it means tonight what America needs is some old-fashioned, independent, fundamental Baptist preachers that will believe God and trust God and learn how to get miracles from God and do great work for God. Somebody say amen. What America needs tonight is some, is some good godly mamas that will wash dishes and sing Amazing Grace and love their children and teach their children and some good godly daddies that go to work in a steel mill and love their families and go to their church and go soul winning and love God and do a work for God. Amen. Amen. May God help us tonight at the First Baptist Church of Hammond, Indiana to realize. Now, I want to tell you this. This church, uh, 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 on May the 27th, 1973, I trusted Christ to be my Savior. I was, the year I turned 21. Up to, up to that point, I was a very rebellious, doing things I had no business doing. I'd been married, I had a brand new baby, in a lot of trouble, and that night I went forward and got saved at the, at the Victory Baptist Church in Lorraine, Ohio. I walked out and got saved. When I got getting, done getting saved, then I sat down. There was about 50 people there in church that night. The preacher said, if Ron had some clothes, we'd baptize him. And I said, baptize me in what I got on, amen. I walked up in that room, took off my shoes, climbed in the baptism, my blue shirt, my white, my white jeans, my white socks. I had on, I was wearing Chuck Taylor Converse that night. He baptized me in what I had on. And I wore them same clothes home that night. Now I've never got over being saved. Amen. And what we need tonight is some men that'll quit trying to run a church like, like, like an organization run by the Holy Ghost of God and getting folks saved. Oh, I love your preacher. Your preacher and I had supper together last night. He came to the 
in meeting with us last night. And what a great man of God. He took me by his home over off of Holman Avenue. And what a great man of God you have for a preacher. I'll tell you how this church has made it. It's made it because Dr. Wilkerson walks with God and knows how to get out of the boat and walk on the water and do something great for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Dr. Hiles taught us success is a man getting up one more time more than he falls down. I'm going to give you this. I'm going to give you three things tonight, and I, 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 <laughs> I'll be brief. I just lied to myself. Amen. Uh, uh, it, number one, failure does not mean you're finished. You just got to keep getting up. You know, I failed some classes at college. I came through here. Nobody knew me. It, it, was, a, it was a whirlwind coming through Hiles Anderson College. In the, and if I hadn't been for a preacher, I wouldn't have stayed. But Dr. Hiles was the greatest man of God I'd ever met, and he was worth the trip. But, but I, I, I struggled. I was a bus captain, a bus driver for four years. I worked at Blah Knox 40 or 50 hours a week. I went to school from 8 o'clock to 1 o'clock. Still found time to play some intramural softball, some intramural basketball, and some intramural football with three children. And I, and, 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 but I made many mistakes in my own church. I've made many mistakes at my own church. But the key to walking on water, the key to being good with God, the key to having God answer your prayer, so you've got to keep getting up, keep moving forward, dust yourself off, move on and go serve God. Amen. Do not quit because things don't go your way. Do not give up because things don't go your way. And look, look, I have three children, 143, Tammy, Julie, who went to college here and married a preacher, and, and uh, my son Jonathan turned my son Jonathan turned 42 this week. While on my way to preach here, my son had his 42nd birthday at home. I have six or seven, I'm not sure exactly, grandchildren. And in a few days, my granddaughter will give birth to my great granddaughter. Amen. God's good. Now I'm not going to be tacky and cheap and pull out pictures of my children and grandchildren. But if you got a minute, I'll show you why you got time. Amen. But in a few days, I'll be a great grandfather. And God has been so good to me, but I want you to know that I've messed up many times in my life. I was telling a college today, we have a man in our church, his name is Vincent Burwell. He's a good black brother, he drives a truck, and he got saved, I he weighed about 300 pounds, and I baptized him. When he went under, the water ran over my waders, and went down in my waders, and he baptized me at the same time. He was a great brother, he never got married, served God at our church, uh, just, just, just a wonderful man. And Brother Eddie, he lived by himself. And one day he didn't come to work. I'm telling you today, tonight, church, look, failure and losing and, 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 get, and hurting does not mean that you can't go serve God and do great things for God. You just have to keep getting up, keep going on, and let God use you. Hey, Brother Eddie didn't come to work one day, and his boss called me and said, Preacher, Brother Burwell didn't come to work. He's real prompt. Drives early, stays late, and works hard. We went to his house. I didn't, but some other men went to his house and he had a heart attack and was dead in the living room. He died like he lived by himself. That was a sad story, but a good man saved the brother. Well, he, his family attended a, an all-black church in the area, a good, a good church. And uh, I'd never been there, and so they, they invited me to preach his eulogy. You're his pastor, you know him well, would you come preach his eulogy? I said, I'd be glad to. So Brother Roy, I went there, uh, Brother Roy went there to preach. And I arrived at church. And there was a bunch of people there, and so I stood in the back waiting for the preacher, like I did with Ray Young out in the vestibule tonight. A lady came in, big hat on, dressed real nice, and she said, how you doing? She said, you brother Talis? And she said, well, I'm the pastor here. <laughs> and it was a lady, and I thought, mm -mm. what would preacher think if he knew I was preaching with a lady preacher? Come on. And I thought, well, he's watching me, he knows, he taught me, and well, I said, okay. Now I got, I'm in a dilemma now, what am I going to do? Second lady comes in and she said, you brother Tally? I said, she said, I'm the assistant pastor here. God bless you. So now, now there's two lady preachers. We get ready to have a funeral. He's laid there. So anyway, they said, let's go to the platform. I'll follow them up. One sits there, one sits there. And I sit over here on the platform with two lady preachers. And I'm thinking, what would my college think? What would the preacher think? What is my people going to think? What would all my college, what, what, what? but anyway, I said, nothing plus nothing equals nothing. So they come up, they introduce themselves, that organ player, there, 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 there. And, and so anyway, she got up, she introduced me, and I got him to, get, to give the eulogy. Well, I told how he got saved, how he got baptized, how he lived for God, how he loved God. And, and, I, and he got to go, well, while I was preaching and giving the eulogy, this man got up and went to the organ. 
And the more I preached, the more he played the organ. And he, he played in tune to my preaching. I'm telling you, the Bible didn't say it. Mm -mm, mm -mm. All have sinned. Mm -mm, mm. Come short of the glory. And, and look, it really got on at this funeral. Well, I got in, he got in, wasn't nobody there but me and him. I got done with my time, went to sit down. The lady got up and said, said Reverend Tally, you're doing so good, you can have the whole service. So I preached the next whole hour at that church, sweating and preaching and having a good time on Vincent Burwell. But I got to tell you, I'm not sure that was good, bad, right, wrong, or indifferent, but I had a good time. But it, I'm going to tell you, church, there's a lot of phases in our life, but we don't have to quit because we fail. Peter got out of the boat, he walked on the water, and yes, he sank, but he got up and went on with God and kept living for God. Because you fail and messed up, you can still do something for God. Amen. Oh, God, good. Let me read you a little form I pulled up. My secretary got this for me. When things go wrong, as they sometimes will, the road you're charging seems all uphill. When the funds are low and the debts are high and you want to smile, but you have to sigh. I just saw myself on TV again. <laughs> when care is fretting you down a bit, rest if you must. Just don't quit. Life is strange with its, twi with its twists and turns, as every one of us sometimes learns. And many a failure comes about. When he might have won had he stuck it out. Don't give up, though the pace seems slow. You may succeed with another blow. Success is failure turned inside out to silver tent of clouds of doubt. And you, you can never tell just how close you are. It may be near when it seems so far. So stick to the fight when your heart is hit. It's when things seem worse that you must not quit. Amen. Y'all don't quit. Stick by the, even though you have mistakes and failures, don't quit. This young boy. Not a Hiles Anderson boy, a Hiles Anderson young lady. This young boy met this girl and he liked her. She was pretty, he was handsome. They wanted to go date, and so she invited this boy to her house for supper. So this young man went down by the local florist shop, and he picked up three bouquets of flowers. Well, the florist, had, that was unusual for anybody. He said, why you got three bouquets of flowers, son? He said, well, mister, he said, I had met me a girl. And he said, I'm going to her house for supper tonight. I'm going to meet her mom and daddy. And he said, I've got three bouquets. Number one, if she sits with me on the front porch swing, I'm going to give her a bouquet. Number two, if she sits real close to him, I'm going to give her a second bouquet. And miss, if she gives me a little kiss, I'm giving her a third bouquet. The floor said, sounds like a plan to me, son. He said, it is a plan, sir. He got in his car, he drove home. That night went to her house for supper. He arrived there, he knocked on the door. The little girl came, said, come on in. He's carrying three bouquets of flowers, sits by the front door. He gets in, they're going to sit down for supper. They sit down and the little girl turns to her boyfriend and says, Honey, why don't you leave us into a word of prayer and bless the food? Well, this boy said, I'll do that. Oh, dear Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Oh, God, I pray you'd bless this food we're about to eat tonight. Oh, God, you sure. And that boy prayed like an old-fashioned Baptist preacher. He got done praying to the Lord in Jesus' name, amen. The girl said, she said, I didn't know you could pray like that. And he said, I didn't know your daddy was a florist either. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you never know what may happen, amen? But I can promise you serving God is a good thing and a joy. And if you'll hang in there, God will see you through. <laughs> I just, I, 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 we have a young man at our church, his name was Johnny Rocket. And Johnny didn't have a driver's license, brother Eddie, so we bought him a motor scooter. He was working at, at one of them restaurants. and come out one night and hit the back of a car. And when he hit this car, his, 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 the, the motorcycle jumped back, and he came, came back and hit his, the car hit him, hit his head on the bumper and gave him a bad concussion. I was out of town preaching, and they called me and said, Preacher Johnny Rockett's in, in the intensive care over at MCB Hospital, and said, he's not doing very well. I said, should I come home? They said, no, he'll be there when you get home, just wait. So a couple of days before Eddie, I got home, went to the hospital to see Johnny Rocket, and he had had a concussion, had about 20 stitches, and, had, and he, he was, he, but he was going to be all right, but still in the trauma ward at MCV. And while I'm giving, are you watching me with the clock, brother Eddie? You got to help me in there. I mean, okay, you're watching me because I'm watching that clock too, amen. I went to see Johnny Rocket, I'm visiting and praying with him, brother Eddie, and, we have, and everything is going well, and they have a little curtain pulled, and a voice says, are you a preacher? And I said, yes, sir. Come over here and pray for me. Okay. So I'm over in this curtain. There's an older man, an aged gentleman, older than 65, laying there in bed. So uh, that was funny, wasn't it? Yeah. So anyway, and he got both arms bandaged up, got his head bandaged up, and got his chest bandaged up. I said, sir, are you, are you saved? He said, yes, sir, I'm born again. I said, I'm on my way to heaven. I'm washed in the blood. I ain't worried about that. I just want you to pray that I can get healed up and go home and go back to work. 
He had arms about that big, legs back like that. And, 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 old, just, and I said, sir, how old are you? He said, 93. And you want to go home and go back to work? That's what I said. I said, well, if you don't mind me asking, what happened to you? He said, I did something stupid. I said, oh, don't say it so. He said, yes, sir. What would you do? He said, I was plowing the garden with my tractor. And he said, I got some roots bound up in my plow. And said, I got off my tractor to pull the roots out of the plow. He said, and, and the, the plow wasn't up high enough by the hydraulics. So I went around to the hydraulics up and I bumped the shifter and my tractor ran over me. Said it broke my ribs, broke both of my arms. Said it crushed my lungs. Said just about killed me. Said busting my head open. He said, but I'm going to be, I'm going to live. And I said, I said, sir, that, that sure was foolish. How old are you, boy? And I said, 63. He said, you got 30 more years of foolishness in you. <laughs> I picked my chest up, straightened my tie. I said, not me, sir. I said, no, sir. I said, I've learned some things along the road of life. He laughed said, you ain't learned nothing. I said, all men are stupid. They do stupid stuff. And said, you're going to be doing crazy stuff till you get to be 93. It wasn't but a couple of days. Something happened. I went to my church. I said, that man was right. Men, men aren't very smart, but I got to tell you, we, I got a lot of failures in my life. His name was William. So every time somebody, one of our men does something crazy at church, we call it Williamology. Why'd you do that? I don't know. I just thought it would work, you know. And, uh, but but there, 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 there's a lot of failures in our life. But if you'll stay with God, I promise, God, Dr. House said success is getting up one more time than you fall down. How to be a water walk Christian, number two. I, 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 I'll hurry through here. Number two, you gotta, you got to believe you can do what God said to do. Amen? you got to believe when God said it, you can do it. you got to remember this. Our life is not built on sinking sand. Our life is built... Uh, the Holy Bible must have been written by God and not a man. For no bad man would, if he could, sit out to write a book this good. And no good man would write a book you couldn't believe. The Holy Bible must have been written by God and not a man. You can believe that Bible. That Bible will see you all the way through. And you can believe what God said it. You can believe it. You can trust it. And you can do it. Amen. But they had a lady in my church that couldn't have children. Only with all she has two children. God gave her two children. Church, you listen. You remember this. When God says you to walk on the water, you get out of the boat and go walk on the water because it can be done. Amen. When I, when I was, I got saved in May of 1973. In July of 1974, I was in Hammond, Indiana. So I'd been saved 14 months when Dr. Hiles became my pastor. But they had the first Sunday in church in the old auditorium. They hadn't done the auditorium yet. It was still just half the size of the Dak House Auditorium. The next, next few years, we spent like out, out at the, the Genesis Center and the, and, and the Civic Center and all that having church. We'd come here, drop, my wife wouldn't. I was on a bus route. Come here, drop our children off and go somewhere else for church with Dr. Hiles. I've been saved 14 months. I walked the aisle. We joined, but Brother, Brother uh, Colston met us, and we joined church. Brother Colston came to our little house. I lived on Wilcox Avenue. Right? Anybody know what that is? Right over here? It's, it's, it's a tough place over there. I lived in a downstairs apartment. And, uh, and it, you know, it, that was my, my first Sunday. I didn't know the Romans Road. I, I, I didn't, I just knew God had called me to preach. We come to church that first Sunday. It was Two or three thousand people in the auditorium. I mean, we were we were lost. There's about seventy five people in my home church, where I stayed about a year. And uh, it, I left my mother, and my father. I left my wife's mother and father and everything we knew, and came to Hammond, Indiana, to go to work in a steel mill and attend Hiles Anderson College. I was scared to death. I didn't know what I was going to do. Didn't know anybody at church. Nobody. But then when we came to town the first time, we stayed with Henry Brown. And Jan Brown out in Wheaton. They were just godly, wonderful people to us. Had church Sunday night. Monday morning, I had to be at United States Steel Mill, Gary, Indiana, at 8 o'clock to go to work as a machinist apprentice. They had transferred me from the Rain Steel Mill, from the U.S. Steel Mill, Rain, Ohio, transferred me to the Steel Mill and to Gary, Indiana. I got up the next morning, uh, John, when I started my car, put the key in, nothing happened. And I said to myself, man, what's going on here? And I turned the key and I looked and my hood was propped open. My first Monday, and my first weekend and my first Monday, my first day on the job in Hammond, Indiana. So I got in my car, raised the hood, battery was gone. Both cables had been cut, and they said they tied them together, they carried with the handle. And here I, I didn't have any money. I had two babies. I had a wife, a job waiting on me. I didn't know what to do. There were no cell phones, obviously. So I started walking. I come across a little bridge, I come down Calumet Avenue, and I came, I came past a little store. And a man came out of that store. 
He said, where are you going? I said, I said, I got some problems. I said, I'm all right. He said, you one of them Hiles boys? I said, yes, sir. Went to Hiles Anderson College. He said, what's wrong? I said, well, I said, my battery was stolen last night after church sometime. And I got to go to work and I don't have any money. I didn't have a credit card. I didn't have $2 to rub together. I just knew God had called me to preach. He said, where are you going? I said, down to church. He said, what are you going to church for? I said, well, I'm going to go see the preacher. I said, he'll help me. I guarantee you he'll help me. He said, well, the preacher's not there. I said, where, where preach preacher at? He said, well, he's flying out of town. I said, flying out of town? Monday? He said, yeah. I said, what for? He said, but he's going to go save America. I said, well, he got his own church. Why would he go save America? He said, well, he does it every Monday and Tuesday. Are you trying to tell me my new preacher leaves town every Monday and Tuesday? Who takes care of the church? I said, it takes care of itself. He got men working with him. I said, he gone. He gone. I guess I won't go to church. He took me by the Eddie. He put me in his car. Carried me to Calumet Auto Parts. He bought me a battery. He bought me two battery cables. He took me back to Wilcox Avenue. Helped me put it on. He shook my hand and left. You thank God didn't have his hand upon your church and your people and this great work. Can I tell you this, church? It may be if it had not been for him, I may have gone home. I'm not a great preacher. I have no right to be in this pulpit. But I've seen thousands of folks saved, thousands of folks baptized, thousands of answers to prayer. And it all started at the First Baptist Church. But Eddie, uh, Mr. Misco used to take care of us. The guy with the bow tie. But the boy comes to the nursery, take, Miss Lanou looked out for my wife. Y- y'all don't know the scales probably, do you? You know who the scales family is? Who's Holland talking to me? You know who they are, Brother Eddie? Brother Eddie, every Wednesday night, they brought groceries to the nursery and gave it to my wife. Every Wednesday night. He bought groceries for my family and I took them to the nursery and dropped them off. He worked for like hostess bread or something like that. So he always had cupcakes and ding-dongs and moon pies and, and things Brother House hated, you know. Brother House thought if you bought pizza, you ought to throw the pizza away and eat the cardboard. It'd be healthier for you. <laughs> but I'll tell you what I've done. I believe God had called me to preach and I wouldn't quit. And church, let me, let me tell you, don't ever stop being nice. Don't ever stop being kind. All these college students need you to love them and take care of them. I have spent my whole life loving people, going about doing good, being kind one to another. The very things that Dr. Hiles in this church, by the way, that man's name was, was Jack Burns, who took care of me out there, Brother Eddie, bought me a battery. And, and he, he later went home himself, but he bought me a battery and took care of me. I wrote these down. I got this form. It says this. Look all around you. Find someone in need. Help somebody today. Though it be little, a neighborly deed. Help somebody today. Help somebody today, somebody along life's way. Let sorrow be ended. The friend is befriended. Oh, help somebody today. Many are waiting a kind, loving word. Help somebody today. Thou hast a message, oh, let it be heard. Help somebody today. Many have burdens too heavy to bear. Help somebody today. Grief is a portion of some everywhere. Help somebody today. Some are discouraged and weary in heart. Help somebody today. Someone that on a journey to heaven should start, so go help somebody today. I would say to you today, you ought to believe that what God said to do, you can do it. Number three, let me give you this. When you get tired of boat life, you will see God do some great things in your life. Let me share this with you. There, there are all the men sitting in that boat, and they're all rowing. Here comes Christ walking on the water. They look out, they see him, 12 disciples. And God says, be not afraid of his eye. And God bids Peter. And Peter says, it's you, Lord, bid me to come to you. And, all, and, and there's a, other men sit, all sitting there all around him. All the men said, you can't do this, Peter. He had never read the book on how to walk on water. He had never been to Benny Hand school how to walk on water. Sorry about that. I shouldn't have done that. I'm, at, I'm out at home. But he had never learned how to walk on water. But when God said, come here, Peter got out of the boat and went to where Jesus was. Let me tell you this. Eleven men stayed in that boat. You know, everywhere I go, there's preachers and men sitting in the boat. They're comfortable. They're warm. They got a good salary. They're doing good. But they ought to do is get out, get out of the boat and go serve God. Amen. Hey, church, every mom and dad, listen up tonight. You ought to get out and go serve. You ought to, you ought to, you ought to get tired. I was, I, we were fishing, Brother Eddie, with a boy named Doug Basham. And we were out in, in the James River, and the river runs very fast. We're small mouth fishing. And I was carrying a tackle box. 
And he said to me, and, and he went through about an eight foot, ten foot of water, about three or four foot deep, running about 30 miles an hour. And I about fell. And I shook a tackle box and it opened up and the tackle fell and I closed it, climbed up on the thing. And, and I just lost my microphone. God's good. Amen. That happens a lot. One time I my coat, popped in my coat up and swung and the microphone came flying off. <laughs> That's funny. But anyway, I said, hey, Doug, I said, I lost some of your tackle. And he said, it don't matter as long as I didn't lose my car keys. I said, where are your car keys at? He said, in the tackle box. I opened it up, no car keys. We were, we were down at Pony Park, Richmond, Virginia. I said, your keys fell in the river. He come back. We spent about 30 minutes looking. and di You dive in, it wash it down. You dive in, it wash it down. We never could. He got all mad at me, frustrated. I was just preacher, but he was mad because I lost his keys. He went to watch. So I'm, I'll go find the phone and call my wife. His truck was locked, couldn't get in it. He got about 30, 40 yards away and said, Hey, here's a great man of God. Pray and ask God to give me them keys. I said, Okay. I said, Dear Lord, I need some help right here. If you'll help me find these keys, I shall be grateful. I dove in the water, dove in, dove in. Finally, I come by a little thing, spark. I picked up, there's car keys where I got washed down the river, came back, said, Hey, man, I got your keys. He said, You're lying? I said, I'm a liar. Sometimes I lie, but not this time. I really got your keys. Amen. <laughs> You know what, when you meet somebody, believe God that God will give them miracles. You, do we believe God will heal cancer? We believe God will save your loved ones. Why do you get tired of boat life? Get tired of the average. Get tired of, look, you can still rear good children. You can still have good homes. You can still be blessed of God. But you've got to be to God in heaven that will help you get out of the boat, answer your prayers, and do great things for you. Amen. My sister, God bless her, my oldest sister. I wish I had time to tell you that story. Maybe I'll give you a little bit of it. I have th I'm the baby of five children. My daddy was an alcoholic. What time do you normally get out, Brother Eddie, on Wednesday night? When I get done. That's very dangerous. But no, I'm just kidding. My daddy was an alcoholic, spent all his money up. My mother was a working mother, so we raised ourselves as children. And when I turned about 17 and a half, I moved out, a very angry young man. My three sisters ended up getting married at the age of 15, all three of them, and they scattered abroad. And then my, after I came to House Anderson, my brother-in-law came to House Anderson, and Brother Eddie, we both lived in the house right next to the youth center that got tore down, right, right next to the, the, to the, uh, to the where the church was, y'all built the youth center at. And when I moved out, they tore it down, they condemned it, it was such a bad house. But we lived there together, and, and they, they separated, and then in, and, uh, you know, church, uh, let me give you a good stat. My youth director has been with me 31 years. My piano player has been with me 30 years. Uh, the folks that have, we've started my church, they're still with me 30 years later. Now I run them off pretty quick. I win a bunch of them, I run a bunch of them off. But every now and then folks say, but I had the same assistant pastor and piano player, music director, the same one for over 30 years now. Well, my, my oldest sister retired, living in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. She said, Ronnie, I'm... My mother got breast cancer in 1996. She died in 2002. My daddy got very sick in 1996. And he died in 1999. I was at my mom and daddy's house. I was coming to pastor school, and I was with my dad. And my dad said, Ronnie, we need to come down to your church and live. Now, I'm the youngest of the five children. Why would he want to live with me? And I said, Dad, I don't think I can work that out. I said, I've got a, we're a Baptist church, and I'm not sure you'd fit in, you know. I just don't think this would work. And my mother was a bus captain doing very well serving God at Brother, at Brother Lose's church in Ohio at that time. Anyway, Brother Schmel became the pastor there. They moved to my church. And they moved to a little, little house on a church property. My, my, my mother, the church loved my mother. My mother loved church. My dad did very well. And ended up, my dad ended up being one of my deacons. In uh, 1999, my father died. And in, and in 2002, my mother died of breast cancer. My oldest sister had come to my church to help my mother. She was an oncologist nurse. And through that, they sold their house in Pigeon Forge, and they moved to Virginia to be at my church. My, my, baby, sister, my baby sister was already living at church, which was serving God, which had been with me my whole ministry, my sister Nancy. My middle sister Mary got ovarian cancer. She lived down in Clover, Virginia. And she moved to the church house for three and a half years while she fought cancer. And my sister took care of her. So I, I now have all three of my sisters in my church. Now you know why I'm like this. I just can't help it. I'm just kind of crazy. 
All of them knew how to pastor better than I did, you know. Ronnie, why you do this? And Ronnie, why are you so funny? And Ronnie, we're not having a political rally, you know. I, all the time. God blew you crazy. <laughs> anyway, my sister had been living there about, about a year or two, and she got cancer, one in a million. She called me on a, on a, on a Saturday or a Friday night and said, Ronnie, I'm sick. I went and picked her up, took her to the hospital. Stayed all night with her. The, the hospital said, you have diverticulitis. She went and saw a specialist. She was diagnosed with a very serious. I can't tell you what it was. It's a rare, very rare cancer. When they find out, they give you one year to live. They were six months behind. She lived four months. Ten months after she got diagnosed, she died with cancer. My middle sister died two months later of cancer, and I buried both my sisters. And right now, in the last 14 months, I buried both my sisters and my mom and dad. But I got to tell you, it gives me no right to quit. No right to be bitter. I must trust God and believe God that I can do. I can get out of the boat and I can go serve God and God give me miracles. I was headed this way. My baby sister came to see me. And she said, Ronnie, and she come in the office, she's crying. Don't ever pass your sister and her crying. You can't get nothing done, you know. And I said, Nancy, what's wrong? She said, Ronnie, she said, you know, when I got married at 15, I had a little diamond ring. I said, yes, ma'am. The judge of the peace had married her. And she said, well, I, I went to look and said, I lost a diamond out of that ring. Well, that's 50 years old. You wore it out. <laughs> but any, anyway, I thought that was funny, too. But anyway, she said, I, 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 she said, I thought, what do you want me to do? She said, well, you know, you get all your prayers answered. And you're the miracle walking on preach, water preacher. I said, can you pray I can find my diamond? I said, really? You got one little chip of a diamond. The FBI couldn't find it with a magnifying glass. You want me to pray it in? Hey, y'all, hey, y'all, I'm good, but I ain't that good. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> so, but they had to be got together and kneeled and prayed with dear Lord God, God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, vindicate thyself. Show thyself strong on behalf of me. Let my sister find her diamond. I just forgot about it. About a month later, she comes to the office crying again. What'd you lose this time? What you want now, you know? She's crying and she held it up. She said, I found my diamond. I said, where? She said, I was vacuuming out the car. And it was laying in the back seat in the carpet. And I saw it. She had a little gun of light got on and I picked it up. And it was my diamond. And she hugged me and said, you surely are a man of God. And I said, I know you ain't God. <laughs> Folks, I wish, I wish you knew how, how important this church has been to me. Uh, I love to come in and see Brother Eddie still serving God. I love to stay at John Rice's house. He's been so good to me. And be with Brother Ray Young. Him and I came to college together 44 years ago. Still sticking by the stuff. And church, I would say to you, keep getting miracles from God. Keep loving people. Keep caring. Keep running buses. I, 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 got a, I had a great time last night at, the, at the, little, the college behind me in the federal building. We had a great time last night. And, and uh, I think that's what church is all about. And I, church, y'all just keep up the good work. And uh, next time, Brother Wilkins invites you back to preach on Wednesday night. What did I just say? The next time I come back, you'll still be serving God at the First Baptist Church of Hammond, Indiana. And you'll keep, you'll keep, keep doing what needs to be done. Rearing good children. Jerry Vargo came to me last night. We worked at UPS together. Reminisced and had a great time. Two old men telling the same old stories. It's a shame. <laughs> it is. It's funny, ain't it? God's good. Let me. An old man traveled the Lone Highway. He came at the evening. Hey, let me back up a little bit. This is a favorite poem by the house. Here's a quote for me. And I loved it very much. I am, if, I, if I've ever done anything for God, I owe it all to Dr. Jack Hiles, my pastor, for 25 years. Dr. Hiles called me here, Brother Eddie, he was preaching, Behold, this dreamer cometh on cassette tape. Somebody bought it and gave it to me. I played that cassette tape till it wouldn't play anymore. And God called me to preach. When I left here, Brother Hiles sent me to Florida. When I left Florida, Brother Hiles sent me to Virginia. I know where he's going to send me at next. I guess I'll join him in glory. Amen. Brother Hiles, one of his favorite poems, An old man traveled the lone highway, and he came at the evening cold and gray to a chasm vast and deep and wide through which is flowing a sullen tide. That old man crossed in the twilight dim, for that stream held no fear for him. But when safe on the other side, he stopped and built a bridge 
to span the tide. Old man said a fellow pilgrim near, you're wasting your strength while building here. Your journey will end at the end of day, and you never again will pass this way. You've crossed this chasm vast, deep and wide. Why would you build a bridge to span the tide? That old man lifted his old gray head. Good friend in the path I've come, he said, there follows after me today a fair-haired youth who must pass this way. He too must cross this chasm vast, deep and wide, and he too must cross in the evening tide. And this stream, which was naught to me, to that fair-haired youth, it may a pitfall be. He too must cross in the twilight dim. Good friend, I'm building this bridge for him. You, you wouldn't know it, but this church built great bridges for me to be a preacher. Nobody at college believed I'd ever get to preach. I had a speech impediment. Here's how I would do it. I'd go sewing with Eddie. And I would go, hello, my name is Ron Tellum from Rapture Church of Hammond, Indiana. I'm going to get saved. They said, what? I said, hello, my name is Ron Tellum from Rapture Church of Hammond, Indiana. I'm going to get saved. Huh? So this is what I had to do. Hello, my name is Ron Talley. I'm from the big church downtown. <laughs> now, I wonder if y'all would like to get saved. That's how, because I had a, and, and, but somehow, by the grace of God now, I got my first Social Security check. I got a Medicare card. I'm going to get me some beautiful shorts and go to Florida and play shuffleboard. <laughs> my hair is white. I'm almost blind. The days of my youth are far behind. My neck is so stiff I can barely turn my head. And Brother Eddie said I can only hear half of what's being said. <laughs> my legs are so wobbly I can barely walk. But thanks be to God I can still talk. And this is the message I want you to get. I'm still kicking. I'm not dead yet. I love to go to church at Sunday school too and hear the word of God that's ever so true. And when I come to the end of my road to my heavenly home, I'll go. And when I leave this old body of clay, you listen close, you'll hear me say, this is a message I want you to get. I've just moved on. I'm not dead yet. Amen. May we serve God with our lives, see some miracles and get good things done and do all we ought to do for the cause of Christ. Thank you, church, and God bless you. Amen.